Good morning. My name is Erwin Chemerinsky, and I have the great pleasure of being the Dean of Berkeley Law. I'm delighted to welcome you to this very important symposium on reforming policing through changing labor relations. The tragic killing of George Floyd and the protests in literally all 50 states focused national attention on the problems of race and policing. But all of us know that the problems of race and policing and excess of police force are nothing new. In 1968, the Kerner Commission wrote, of the problems with regard to race and policing and excess of force, literally every major city in the United States. 20 years ago in 2000, did a report on the Los Angeles Police Department in the wake of the Rampart scandal, talked about the problem of excess of force in that department and the failure to discipline officers who engage in excess of force. I talked about how it was a department that exalted Dirty Harry and Sean Serpico. What I found in Los Angeles, we could see in any major city. My hope though is that the national protests that occurred last spring focused attention on the problems of policing in a new way and provide a basis for reform greater than that that we have ever seen. And it's so crucial that we take advantage of that attention and that energy to bring about meaningful police reform. Many proposals have been advanced since last spring on how to change policing, how to hold police more accountable, how to improve police discipline. Some have even suggested abolishing the police. My guess is that's unrealistic for so many reasons, that it, every society needs some form of policing, even if some tasks might be transferred from police to other agencies I would favor, they're still going to be police. We can't avoid then the question of how do we reform policing? How do we deal with the problems of excess of force and racism in policing? In dealing with issues of reform, one crucial aspect is the police themselves and the police unions that represent them. How can we engage the police and police unions to be a force for effective, meaningful reforms with regard to the police? We know that in many places, police unions have been an obstacle to effective change. How do we overcome that? How do we get the police to be part of the solution, not the problem? I am convinced that if we're ever going to find a way of significant reform of police departments, it's got to be with labor, with police as a key part of all of the efforts that are done. Well, that's the focus of today's program. It couldn't be more timely. It couldn't be more important. It's being put on by the Berkeley Center on Law and Work. It's one of its first major programs. And I'm very grateful to it for all of its efforts. I especially want to thank Professor Catherine Fisk, Jenny Boyden, Pamela Erickson. Putting on a conference like this is always an enormous amount of work. I think it's even more work when we're talking about doing it via Zoom. So I really want to thank them for making all of this possible. I want to express my great thanks to all of the speakers who are part of it. It's a really impressive lineup of speakers and a terrific program. And I'm grateful to all of them for taking their time to be part of this. Also, I want to thank all of you, the audience. I do believe it's our shared attention and concern with regard to policing that offers the opportunity for meaningful reform. It's now my great pleasure to introduce to you one of my heroes, Joe Groden. I heard a long time ago, you don't need to have many heroes if you choose your heroes wisely. Well, Joe Groden is and has long been one of my heroes. I'll just do a short bio because if I told you all of his accomplishments and credentials, I could probably fill the whole symposium time. Um, grew up in California. He received his bachelor's degree with honors from UC Berkeley in 1951 and graduated with honors from Yale Law School in 1954. He went to England on a Fulbright grant 
and received a PhD in labor law and labor relations from the London School of Economics. He had a distinguished career as a lawyer in San Francisco. He specialized in labor law and he handled pro bono so many civil rights and civil liberties matters. He was a justice and a presiding justice on the California Court of Appeal and then a justice on the California Supreme Court. Then was a professor and an emeritus professor at Hastings Law School. And I'm thrilled that he often also teaches at Berkeley Law. And so with that, I will turn it over to my hero, Joe Grodin. So thank you, Erwin, uh, and welcome everybody. If you ever have a chance to be introduced by Dean Chemerinsky, I'd recommend it highly. Um, when the killing of George Floyd gave rise to a public debate over the proper response to the problem of police violence, a, a group of us, lawyers, former judges, arbitrators, and academics with a background in public sector labor relations and police unions, discussed among ourselves whether we might have something to offer the ongoing conversation. The result is a set of proposals which we have offered for public consideration, including consideration by the state legislature. We recognize that our proposals address a very limited range of issues and that problems posed by police misconduct, police culture and structural racism deserve broader consideration. But we believe that the lens of labor relations provides a useful independent perspective. We recognize also that our proposals can almost certainly be improved through critical examination. And that in fact is the main purpose of this webinar. My own background includes research and writing in the early years of labor relations in the public sector. I, along with many others, maintained that public employees should have the right to form and bargain collectively through unions, and that the legal framework which surrounds collective bargaining in the private sector, with some modifications, provides a valuable model for the public sector as well. Recent events have led many of us to reconsider these generalizations as they apply to the police. Speaking for myself, I still believe in unions and collective bargaining for police. And I share Dean Chemerinsky's conviction that through cooperation with the police is the avenue to change. Uh, but it is a central premise of traditional labor law that the relationship between management and unions is primarily private and autonomous, free of government regulation except as necessary to assure a fair playing field. And that whatever interest the public has can for the most part be taken care of by the balance of power which flows from the bargaining relationship itself. In light of what we have observed on the ground, that central premise needs to be carefully examined as it applies to the unique characteristics of policing. What police unions can bargain about, the process of bargaining, the way in which police conduct is regulated and discipline imposed, and the, wrong, and the role of arbitration, long considered a matter exclusively for the parties themselves, all of these demand reconsideration in light of the intense and legitimate public interest which surrounds them. What should result from that reconsideration and legitimate public interest, um, the nature and extent of modifications that might be required and the proper balance between the competing le legitimate interests, these are the subjects of our agenda today. And so I now introduce to you uh, Professor Catherine Fisk, who teaches labor and employment law, among other things, at Berkeley Law, and is the author of important scholarship on police unions. Catherine? Thank you very much. I'm delighted to introduce our first panel of this program. 
We have two really superb and superbly qualified speakers. Ronald L. Davis was appointed by the United States Attorney General Eric Holder in 2013 as the director of the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services of the Department of Justice. The office is responsible for advancing community policing nationwide and supporting community policing activities of state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies. In 2014, President Obama appointed him to serve as the executive director of the newly created President's Task Force on 20th Century Policing. During the last administration, Mr. Davis came to California and has been working on policing issues for the state of California. He has deep experience in law enforcement, having had a distinguished career as the chief of police of the East Palo Alto, California Police Department, and over 20 years with the Oakland, California Police Department here in my hometown. Our first speaker, though, is going to be Christy E. Lopez, a professor, a distinguished visitor from practice uh, and a professor of practice at Georgetown Law School in Washington, D.C. Professor Lopez served as deputy chief in the special litigation section of the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice and led the division's group conducting pattern of practice investigations of police departments and other law enforcement agencies, including litigating and negotiating settlement agreements to resolve these matters. She helped coordinate the department's broader efforts to ensure constitutional policing. She directly led the team investigating the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department, and was also primary drafter of the Ferguson Report and a negotiator of the Ferguson Consent Decree after the murder of Michael Brown, which was one of the efforts that catalyzed the movement for Black Lives and the contemporary effort to reform policing. Um, she has vast experience with many other police departments. And so it's truly a delight to kick off our first substantive session of the day with Professor Lopez. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Fisk. And, and um, it's so wonderful to be here with all of you and with my good friend, um, Ron Davis. So I, I thought I would start today um, and talk a little bit about the impact of police unions and uh, on police reform and efforts to reduce harmful race disparities in policing based on my own experience uh, investigating police departments and also working with police officers and studying and teaching policing, actually using uh, Dean Chemerinsky's book to teach policing. And I wanna to touch on three issues related to this topic today. Um, one is the way that police unions have traditionally been a powerful political force that can push problematic legislation in candidates and can thwart good legislation in candidates. Another is the way that police unions can play a central role in perpetuating racist policing. And I don't say that lightly. I don't say that to be hyperbolic. I say it because we must attend to this or everything else we are doing at the police labor nexus will be ineffectual, in my opinion. I'm gonna talk a little bit about negotiating the role that police unions play, obviously, in negotiating collective bargaining agreements that undermine accountability and effective policing. But I'm really only going to touch on that because I think some of our other speakers are going to delve into that more deeply. I do wanna note that I don't mean to condemn police unions unilaterally. In fact, I have a very clear memory of the only time I've ever seen my dad on TV. My dad was a homicide detective for the California for a California law enforcement agency for 20 years. And I remember seeing him on the local news at a union meeting where they were, if I remember correctly, they were going to take a vote on whether to strike over wages. And my dad was always very apolitical and very non-confrontational. And I remember seeing him on camera on TV and he is visibly uncomfortable sitting there with his arms crossed in this chair. And I remember at the time thinking how important this must be for him to be there, even though he clearly didn't want to be there. And I knew that he thought he had to be there. He had to register his voice for his wages and his benefits. I'm not against police unions, but I do think the current system is really broken. And that's what I wanna talk about. I wanna to talk today a little bit about why I think that. 
So unions as a political force against reform and accountability. Separate and apart from the collective bargaining agreements that unions negotiate, unions can have a profound negative effect on policing on a city, state, and national level. They push for legislation like the law enforcement bills of rights that have undermined police accountability on, state, on a statewide basis in states across the country. And they push for particular bills that are really antithetical to the kind of policing that we want and that we need. As just one of countless examples, right now in Missouri, there are two police related bills at the state level. One, SB 60, would ban chokeholds, would make it harder for disciplined police officers to join other departments, and would create stricter guidelines for using deadly force. The other, SB 66, would allow for the use of deadly force against protesters and protect drivers who run over protest from any liability, who run over protesters from any liability. Guess which one the Missouri FOP and the St. Louis Police Officer Association spoke out in favor of? Yes, the latter. They spoke out in favor of a bill that would protect drivers who run over protesters and that would allow for the use of deadly force against protesters. Now, I think it's important to note here that the St. Louis Ethical Society of Police and the National Association of Black Law Enforcement Officers, which are also fraternal groups of officers but representing officers of color, they have written and spoken out against this bill. And that brings me to the second impact of police unions that I want to discuss. And that is unions as perpetuators of racist, and I wanna just note as a side here, also sexist policing. Police unions have a long history and a continued pattern of promoting explicitly racist and stereotyped masculinity attitudes and practices, as well as supporting policies and practices that needlessly perpetuate race disparities in the criminal justice system. And unions don't tend to show any concern for these disparities. Much of this, much has been written about this and I've seen it in my own work. We know that police officers are in many cities more likely to be white than the communities they serve. But even in majority minority police forces, union leadership and their executive, by which I mean their executive board and, and their president, is far more likely to be white than the police force from which they are drawn. The Marshall Project recently reported that of the 15 largest departments in which the majority of officers are people of color, only one Memphis has a union leader who's black. And that is no accident. When I went to New Orleans to investigate that department or the Department of Justice, I wondered why alongside the FOP, there was another union, PANO. I learned that PANO had explicitly excluded black officers from their ranks, resulting in the establishment of NOPD's black organization of police and the rising importance of the FOP there. PANO had also openly opposed race integration efforts during the civil rights movement and remained one of the staunchest opponents to police reforms for decades. Even the non-explicitly racist union, FOP, continued to fight reform under the DOJ consent decree that I helped negotiate, unsuccessfully suing the city and DOJ when we ended the corrupt system of cash pay secondary employment. I have sat in rooms with union officials in places like Oakland and Chicago and St. Louis and been surprised at the things that union officials would tell me, even knowing that I was a civil rights investigator. And then Ron Davis was in some of those rooms with me. I remember meeting with the union in St. Louis during the Ferguson investigation in particular. So I know he can speak to many of these things and, and more as, as well. In Chicago, in a meeting between the civil rights division investigators and union officials, union leaders blamed management for the shooting of Laquan McDonald, saying that if management had asked them, the union leaders, they could have told management that Jason Van Dyke was a problem. Just a few weeks later, we returned to union headquarters and Jason Van Dyke was working the front desk. He was, of course, later cr criminally prosecuted and convicted for that shooting. But this is just one example of unions supporting officers they know are violating their oaths by, to abide by the Constitution and to protect people. The current head of the union in Chicago, uh, John Catanzara, op has openly supported the January 6th rioters at the Capitol, and this has city leaders calling for him to resign. He hasn't had police powers in a while. They were removed because of assorted acts of misconduct on his part. He's currently facing 18 disciplinary charges, including a Facebook post from 2017 in which he explicitly disparaged Muslims. Much has been written about the impact of the Minneapolis police union on creating a culture that facilitated the death of George Floyd. The head of that union, Bob Kroll, is finally retiring from Minneapolis PD. He leaves behind 54 complaints, reportedly none of which resulted in formal discipline that was upheld. The first question asked of Bob Kroll during a friendly interview upon his announcement that he was retired, was retiring, 
was, are you a member of the KKK? And what's interesting about this is Bob Kroll's response. He doesn't appear to be offended. His response is to chuckle, deny that he's a member of the KKK, and then note that there's no evidence to back that claim. And if you know anything about Bob Kroll's history, you know why that question was asked. And we should be horrified that explicit racism and the use of egregious force with absolute impunity has been normalized within the ranks, not just of policing, but within the leadership of their recognized representatives. And by we, I mean everybody, members of the public, black or white, and police officers, black or white, should be horrified by this. More broadly, of course, police unions strongly supported President Trump, who was not particularly subtle in his support for white supremacists. Pat Lynch, in fact, the head of the NYPD PBA, endorsed Trump at the Republican National Convention. And it's again worth pointing out that the Guardian Association of the NYPD, which is NYPD's Black Officer Association, expressed their surprise and disappointment when learning of this endorsement. So given this long history and current culture of police unions, it's no surprise that unions negotiate collective bargain agreements that undermine accountability and exacerbate harmful race disparities in policing. That's the focus of the conversation today, and I won't go too deeply into that as others are already slated to do so, but I will just note that based on my work, I absolutely agree that we need more transparency in collective bargaining association, I'm sorry, collective bargaining agreement negotiations and disciplinary decisions. And especially now, I think that would make a difference because I think the public is paying attention to this issue more than they used to. And I think they have a more sophisticated understanding of the impact that collective bargaining agreements and disciplinary processes have on police conduct. And I think that transparency would help counter a dynamic I've seen and I've talked about with city attorneys who are, who are negotiating collective bargaining agreements. And that is that there's an incentive for cities to trade things that will result in immediate and known costs for things that won't. And what I mean by that is that instead of, for example, agreeing to a union request for a workforce-wide pay raise or medical or better medical care coverage for all officers, you agree to their request to remove all disciplinary records from personnel files after one year. The latter option is perceived as costing the city nothing. And essentially what that means is that good police officers end up losing tangible benefits so that bad officers can be protected, which of course means that the union in the end is not negotiating in the best interest of all its members, but rather in the interest of a small subset of officers who are in fact more likely to be the worst officers and are causing the entire police force problems in all sorts of ways. Finally, I do think that some practices, including perhaps discipline, should be, not be subject to bargaining. DC passed, Washington DC, where I live, passed legislation to this effect, it was, which was upheld last fall in the US District Court here in DC. And I think the purpose of taking, of ha the purpose of having discipline in collective bargaining agreements has been to make sure that discipline is meted out fairly. But in my work, I haven't seen these provisions have this effect. You still have heavy, heavy penalties for things like missing court and lighter penalties for things like using excessive force. And particularly in terms of racial disparities and discipline, I've not noticed any difference, although to be clear, I've not studied it, but based on my knowledge of unions overall, I wouldn't necessarily expect the inclusion of discipline in collective bargaining agreements to have a positive effect on race disparities in police discipline. So I think there are, there are some topics like that that we've sort of not really considered as, um, as, as excluding from the bargaining process that I think we should really be open to considering if we're serious about remaking what I think is a pretty broken system. So I hope um, I've tried to underscore what I think is some of the practical import of what's at stake here and how longstanding and powerful the structures we're seeking to dismantle really are. Um, I definitely defer to the views of my good friend, Ron Davis, and I look forward to hearing, him, hearing from him next. Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me just check with the moderator, make sure you can hear my volume okay. Yes. So I'm going to address this from a different angle as a practitioner who has been a cop for close to 30 years and over, over the last 35 years has either been a cop or worked with hundreds if not thousands of police officers and police agencies. And so first, it's, it's really something that the said is that I do support the idea of collective bargaining rights for law enforcement. Um, I'm enjoying my retirement right now based on the negotiations that my police union has set to where I can have defined contributions and have a career that gave me fair opportunity to debate issues of discrimination. So I think we can have this discussion without throwing the baby without out with the bathwater in the sense that there is 
reason to support and to have police unions uh, to protect our police officers as well as we would protect people um, that work in all industries. The question would be now is have we allowed the collective bargaining agreements, those provisions to extend beyond the issues of working conditions almost to the point of entering the issue of public policy and the issue of serving as an inhibitor, if you will, or, or, or some kind of obstacle to accountability. And so quite often we're asked the question is, do police unions contribute to misconduct? And I don't think there's a simple answer. I think they, in some ways, and we'll, I'll talk about this in a second, that police union contracts, some of the internal culture that is set based on the practice of police, is contributing to an entire system that allows conduct to be pervasive and to continue. Before we can really answer the question about what role police unions play in misconduct, I think we have to first set the context in which unions are operating. And what I mean by this is some people, you need to reform police unions in order to reform policing. And I would say that we need to reform our policing system in order to reform police unions. The context in which unions are operating right now to me is based on the fact that policing is still operating using the draconian systems that were designed years ago in the 30s, 40s, and 50s to enforce discriminatory laws. They were designed to oppress communities of color. They are still suffering in our strife with structural racism. So in that sense, when people say that the policing system has failed, I disagree. I think it's worked many instances as designed. And so once we acknowledge that we need to reconstruct or transform transformation, make transformational change to the system, then we can better understand the context in which the individual officers are operating in, as well as the context of the police union. When you have systems that are outdated, systems that are impacted by structural racism, quite often even good officers will have bad outcomes and bad officers get to hide in the system and operate with impunity. So what ends up happening in many cases, the unions are forced then to constantly defend the bad outcomes that good officers have. But the other problem is that they also are as aggressive as defending the bad outcomes that bad officers have. And then the question becomes, how do you determine the difference? I always turn to NYPD as an example of this, stop and frisk. When you look at stop and frisk, which it has been deemed in New York as being unconstitutional, the officers didn't decide to do it. They didn't independently decide that this one was best. The union actually objected to the practice. But now that we trained them that way, we held them accountable that way, we incentivized that behavior. And as soon as we found out there were disparities and things went south, as we say, we then say the officers need more training and try to discipline them individually, which then requires the unit to have to forcefully and aggressively defend those actions. Now embedded in those actions that are being defended are the officers that are racial profiling, that have malicious intent, that are racist, because we have to acknowledge that we do have that in law enforcement. So we understand that context, and this is not making an excuse, it's really understanding the Deming rule, what we call the 85-15 rule, that 85% of any effectiveness of a working group is based on the systems they operate 15% by their own will or skill. So first off, I think we understand the system, and as we start transforming the system, then we have to ask the question is, what is the role of police unions in that. Once again, they should protect working conditions and not get into public value issues. The other thing is I think Professor Grodin said is the question would be is how do we bring them into, into the reform effort? I think we also have to acknowledge how these contracts came about, these provisions. And Christie said it best, the union has no power to impose conditions like you have to wait 24 hours before you can talk to an officer who has killed somebody. Somebody like a, like a mayor, or a city council had to affirm or approve that contract. So we need to work on negotiations. And I think uh, it was mentioned earlier today is we need to make sure negotiations are not based on three main issues for me. One, fear. And this is where the police unions are responsible, creating a fear to the community that somehow police accountability is counter to public safety. That somehow asking for also to be held account accountable individually and collectively will somehow impact negatively public safety. And so that somehow that officers will resign or retire or quit with the notion that we would have the audacity, the temerity to question when they use deadly force. So we must reject all of that. We also have to reject the ideas, Christy mentioned, that we would negotiate conditions or managerial prerogatives based on savings. And that was probably held heavy in the 80s and 90s and created many of the conditions we have now based on the need of saving um, pay raises, if you will. 
The other one is political gains. Most unions now have political have PACs, political action groups, and you have elected officials who have to vote on these contracts are taking endorsements, they're taking contributions, and they are fearful of the political will of the union and therefore will support these contracts in order for political gain. So all of that contributes to this, this idea of what role the union plays. So going back to the question, do police unions contribute to police misconduct? I think police misconduct, one is we have to identify what is meant by misconduct, because for many police unions and police officers, misconduct is different than what for them and what we're saying right now. And two, they contribute as much as individual officers do, as much as the community does, and definitely as much as elected officials. So all that is to say, I think we need major changes. And I really did like the proposals that Judge Henderson and Captain Fritz put out there. We need very significant changes of what we're going to, what we're going to do or what we're going to allow for the police unions. I would say this, there's also for me, the, the, another equal issue is the role that police unions play in internal, setting the culture of policing in the United States. So we know externally, we know the provisions are, many of the provisions are problematic. We know how they exist. I gave you some, some instances why they exist. Um, and we know that they have to change. And I, I don't think we should, be, we should be unapologetic about the need to change those provisions. There is, makes no sense that there's protections against a, an officer who's inappropriate or excessive force or racist should not be protected. The process should be fair. They're entitled to due process, but once it is determined that they're guilty, they should be held accountable. But so we, that part, I don't think there's much disagreement on. The other part is the internal culture that Christy mentioned, and she mentioned with the issue of race. And I think we're going to have to have the courage to look dead, or look ourselves in the eyes and realize that we are still dealing primarily with the issue of race. And I'm gonna give you an example that, that as an officer of color that has really disappointed me and I think highlights the issue of concern. When I worked in the Obama administration, I can recall the police unions being extremely vocal against President Obama when he said that the police acted stupidly in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts from the Harvard professor. I can recall when he said if I had a son that he would look like Trayvon Martin. And some unions went as far as to say that he had blood on his hands and blamed that the idea of wanting reform was causing officers to be either assassinated or ambushed, and they accused him of that directly. January 6 comes, and we have a president that doesn't talk about reform that directly incites an insurrection that kills one officer and, and three others now, or two others have committed suicide, but at least a dozen severely beaten and assaulted, and I've heard nothing. I've heard them put out a memo saying that, or a letter saying that, calling for the president to tell, tell the mob to calm down or to, to stop, but that would suggest they knew he had control over them. But I didn't hear any condemnation of, about the incitement to begin with. I've even heard, I saw a letter where they focused on that, had we not had the, the, the restrictions or military equipment that the police would have been better able to respond and this would not have happened. Once again, with no condemnation of the president for inciting that and even suggesting any ideas of accountability about the militarization of police was somehow contributing to that day. And as an officer of color, that kind of concept, the endorsement of political um, leaders without the vote of the membership, the silence of the political leadership or selective silence of political leadership when they're engaging in misconduct of behavior, and most importantly, this notion of blue lives. And as a black officer, I have to reject this idea of a blue life because blue is quite frankly synonymous with white. It's synonymous with a white male. And the idea that I would have to give up my culture, my identity to be a police officer, we need to reject. Every officer of color, every female officer and every white officer needs to reject that there's a blue life, especially when we know that the whole concept was in opposition of black lives. So the refusal to accept that there's still two Americas that was mentioned in the Kerner Commission the refusal to accept that there's still structural racism and to deny that by then creating Blue Lives Matter as if we're on an equal plane. And that is just, I think that is a problem that contributes to a culture that then protects misconduct and encourages a certain way of thought or ideological views that are counterproductive to police reform. So in one sense, I, I do want to say that I, I, I embrace unions as, as an idea of protecting the rights of police officers. 
I think our fine men and women, which the vast majority are, are doing a tremendous job and they need the support and protection against mismanagement and discrimination and, and disparities like any other working group. But we've allowed that to now transfer way too far. It is not something that is healthy to accountability. And I would hope that the unions would come to the table with the cities and start renegotiation. But I am calling on them to start looking inside the organization to see where that diversity is at and to stop embracing notions that is counter to diversity. How can I embrace diversity? Or how can we be diverse if I have to sell my culture away, my tradition, my identity in order to fit in? So I, I think I would embrace that idea of making them part of reform. And I would point you to the report that uh, Captain Frisk and Judge Felton Henderson and the proposals of them and so many have outlined. I think that is a, a really great starting point on how to change the system. And I see Catherine has popped up, so that's my cue to stop right there. Thank you very much. We still have about 20 minutes, a little bit more in the program. And so what I'd like to do is, or in this segment of our program, what I'd like to do is to, first of all, invite Professor Lopez to respond to any of Professor or Mr. Davis's remarks. And then I also want to invite those of you who are participating in the webinar to use the Q&A box on your screen to pose questions to our speakers. And then I'll moderate from those questions and perhaps even raise some of my own. Professor Lopez? Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, I don't have a whole lot. I can't think of a single thing actually that I disagree with um, Mr. Davis about. So uh, I don't have much of a response. Just to say that I think it's I think it's significant, and I think this is a theme that I hear and I have heard for years now that there are police officers, mostly police officers of color, but also white officers who are not happy with the status quo um, with, with unions. And I think that's that's important. And and I also in one thing that that Mr. Davis says that I want to emphasize um, is that unions have been very good at um, basically being fear mongers and not only with the public along the lines of with public officials um, a, a, as he's talked about, but also with officers. And so many officers are, are really worried about what will happen if they uh, buck the union line, if they agree to some of these things, they buy into this, I, these ideas that if they support more restrictive force policies, they're endangering themselves or their, or their fellow officers. And I'm finding it very, um, encouraging that more officers are questioning that even as we're seeing more polarization and more, um, you know, sort of really reactionary thinking among some elements of, of unions. So I don't, you know, it's one of those many things that we're facing in our country. It's a little unclear which way uh, things are going to go, but there are definitely alongside some discouraging signs and some encouraging signs as well. Thank you very much. Before we turn to questions from our webinar audience, I wanted to follow up on something that each of you said. Um, I wanted to follow up on what um, Mr. Davis said about how to empower people within police departments who don't speak, whose views are not represented by the leadership. You referred a couple of times to uh, perhaps the leadership of some police unions not being responsive to the concerns of um, officers of color, female officers, and perhaps other white officers who don't share the views of some of their colleagues. And you also referred to the political power that police unions have, and in particular, the possibility that unions will make uh, political endorsements or political contributions without consulting the views of the rank and file. And so there's a question about whether there are ways that you see that 
unions could be more accountable to the full range of their memberships. In Oakland, California, where I live, there is a very significant number of black and brown officers, female officers. I can't imagine they necessarily share the view of some of the racist union leadership. I don't, I can't speak to the Oakland Police Department union leadership. I don't know them, but certainly the examples that Professor Lopez talked about from Missouri. And so what our particular proposals that um, Judge Henderson, I, Justice Grodin, others proposed didn't actually get to the question of how to restructure the law regulating police unions or public employee unions generally. But since both of you mentioned the possibility that the union leadership doesn't actually speak for the membership, I wonder what you think about feasible reforms in that area, either of you. But I'll start with you, Mr. Davis. Yeah, there's two things. So one, in most departments, a lot of departments, you'll hear that that the union leadership may not be speaking for the rank and file and not just officers of color, but in general. You know, when you're looking at a new generation of millennials and officers coming on board, they themselves, white and black and male and female, are starting to have different views. So one would be is encouraging that new generation and currently on the board. You mentioned Oakland, and I'm going to applaud Oakland because the evolution of the, now part of it just Henderson will get into, Christy has more experience. But the evolution of their board is tremendous. And some of the things that they've embraced, that they stopped fighting based on reform, based on um, the changing and the diversity of the board is, has made a difference. So I think we definitely need to diversify the boards and the representation. Politically, I think we have to make sure communities are informed and really understand that the voice of the union is not the voice of the police department. They're not the voice of public safety. It's amazing how on Monday, community members can be upset with the police department because of abuses and excesses, but on Tuesday, vote for the candidate that has their endorsement. And so once we, if you look at some of the major reform that has occurred, usually occurs when the elected official won despite the endorsement or lack of endorsement by the union. So for the community to realize that the union is there for a specific reason, they should put it in that proper context and not give it power that it should not have. I have old phrases, power perceived is power achieved. So quit giving away power to a union that does not affect public in that way. And so I think if the more political leaders look at well, they play in the union management, if you will, the more we diversify the executive board or the membership, and the more the membership demands more accountability when it comes to political endorsements and public value statements and not that of a core group of leaders, I think that will go long term. Because right now, I mean, it's, it's I'd like to say, I said, it's a stark difference when you look at how the unions are responding to, let's say, President Trump or to now even within the first week with the President Biden. So we need to make sure that that's not the case. You're advoc advocating for law enforcement should be consistent regardless of who the president is. You should be fighting for my safety, my rights, hopefully my pay and my retirement and not getting into these views of whether or not we should have a wall, not have a wall, whether we should basically use enforcement to, to take people to jail for enforcement. All those things are ideological views that are not the purview of the union. Those are public value debates that the public needs to lead, not a police union. I'll just, I'll just add on a couple of things there. I think, I mean, I agree with, with, with all of that. And they're, they all relate to the idea of, of sort of opening up and making more transparent um, these processes. I, I run a program called the Police for Tomorrow program at, uh, at Georgetown. And one of the things we do there is try to elevate the voices of line officers, both sort of educate them and elevate their voices. And I actually think that that's part of this. As Ron says, um, unions do not speak for, for all of line officers, especially the newer officers. And before those officers get jaded and sort of, you know, um, kind of either quit or, 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 or resign themselves to this, I think Police departments need to be um, encouraged and, and perhaps mandated to allow those officers to speak more freely, and that we and that uh, we in the public should be reaching out to those officers directly and hearing what their concerns are and their voices are. I think that's an important element of the transparency that I'm talking about. Um, that will, you know, we need to understand how divergent. I hear it every month in the workshops that we have. How divergent their views are and their opinions are from much of what's being uh, endorsed by union leadership. 
Uh, I think sort of related to that is this, um, this broader transparency. You know, there was a group of activists in Austin who went and set in on the union negotiations. It would, had always, they'd always been open, just no one had ever done it before. And just by being there and the city know that they were, knowing that they were there, they were able to influence the, those negotiations. So I think that's um, a really critical part of this is just that transparency. And then finally, um, related to that, it, it, in the end, this is about holding our public officials accountable. And if they are negotiating union agreements or, you know, supporting SB 66 instead of SB 60 or accepting that union endorsement, well, that's where democracy comes in. And you have to just we have to decide in the end um, how successful and how racist unions will be depends on what we the, how racist we the people allow them to be. I'm just counting real quick. One thing that may help change this is for many states, the unions have, mon have a monopoly, right? Either you basically are a member or you still have to pay those dues to some other entity. So as much as I oppose and disagree with the Janus decision, it does open up basically something now, especially in some places where the officers of color unions or not union, but associations are putting about votes of no confidence and pushing back that there's some options now. And at some point as law enforcement officers, we have to make decisions. In other words, I can't, I, I, how long can I stay with an organization that doesn't represent me, is representing everything that opposes my core values, and quite frankly, is getting closer and closer adopting to some white nationalist views, it's time to leave. And I think there's gotta be some introspective look for the union, sitting with the membership to make sure that this is, well, even if it's inadvertently, cannot happen, but it does open up that window. Like I said, even though I disagree, I don't like the, the, yeah, the finding, it still creates that opportunity. There are a number of questions in the Q&A that ask about generally what either police leadership, police management could do, labor law could do, or city officials could do to modify misbehavior by unions or to police unions or to uh, investigate surface white supremacy or excessive force misconduct by officers. In particular, one person asks, um, would the strong mayor form of city government be effective or a city manager form of city government? In other words, do you see um, greater avenues for success by city leadership and forcing those on the management side of the negotiations? Or do you see the possibilities of uh, changing the relationship of unions to their members or to those who they represent? What do you see, at, or just greater public involvement in negotiations, as Professor Lopez mentioned, where would you prioritize to make changes? Well, I will say this, I spent a year as a city manager and I don't believe it's the form of government, whether it's a council manager or a strong mayor form of government, because ultimately the, the, the governing body, the legislative body has to affirm or to ratify a contract. Even a strong mayor can't do that by him or herself in most jurisdictions. And I think it's more about the not changing the form of government, but it's making sure that the negotiation team, whomever they contain, involves police management to make sure that no, that you're not negotiating away managerial prerogatives and not so much this managerial discretion, but the manager, manager's ability to hold people accountable, right? So you want to protect for fairness. I think that happens over the years. I was still focus on that we're still asking the union to operate in this very flawed system and they can't change by themselves. Because on one hand, if we're going to keep allowing good officers to have these bad outcomes, whether it's because of a loss of force policy, maybe because of the training, in fact, they don't have the escalating skills, then when things go wrong, the union is gonna find itself having to rigorously defend an officer who did exactly what they were told to do, how they were told to do it and why to do it, but it's turned out to be bad. And I think that's the part I don't want people to misunderstand. It's not suggesting that we should be held accountable, 
but the unit does have a job to support officers when they're doing what they're trained to do. And many of the problems we have in policing is not because of a lack of training, it's because we have people doing things that we have set the priorities in our policies that are very harmful to our communities. Change that, then we change the role within the union, change the conditions to make sure that they don't extend into public value discussions would be my priority. The only thing I'll add to that is I think that it's just important to keep in mind that the, um, the steps you need to take to rein in unions and make sure they're acting appropriately is going to differ depending on the, your particular community. So for example, if you have a chief who is legitimately um, you know, committed to making sure that there is fair treatment and that unions don't overstep their bounds, then your job as a public official, for example, is to back that chief, even if it means losing your endorsement from that union. Um, on the other hand, if you have a chief who is using the Peace Officer Bill of Rights or the union conduct as an excuse not to hold people accountable, well, then it's your job to get rid of that chief and get another one. So it really requires you to have a close understanding of the dynamics um, at issue, of the law at issue, um, and respond accordingly. Um, it's not going to be a one size fits all at all. There are some structural things I do think we need to be looking at and for the most part rescinding um, all or, or most or all of the Peace Officer Bill of Rights um, in most in most um, states. Uh, there is, I understand the fears that officers have uh, and it's just not, you can definitely protect officers' rights adequately without those. Um, so I think that that's an important part. And, I, and again, you know, again, to just uh, reiterate a lot of the work that you've done, Professor Fisk, um, you know, this, this idea of taking some things outside the bargaining context, right? I think um, we need to think more seriously about that because then all the temptations we're talking about don't exist. Um, you don't have to worry about that because it's just not something that it can be negotiated with the union. This, uh, Catherine, that's something that Christy said about there's other ways to her concerns. That's the big item right there. I think she nailed it across the board. At first, when you start renegotiating and ask why that provision exists. I'm one, I get the benefit of the doubt before I get into nefarious intent, although you may have nefarious outcomes. But for example, when I went to East Palo Alto, there was a provision there that if cases weren't done within 180 days, I would lose the ability to hold them accountable. State law is one year, but this was 180 days. The purpose of that was because before that rule in the contract, cases were going for two or three years, leaving officers in a balance of what they're what's happening with this allegation, this misconduct investigation. So it was there to address a managerial deficiency, but it's a terrible rule, right? So instead of, we had to find a way now is how do we accommodate that also should have timely investigations, fair and independent objective investigations. But the fact that if it's not, that should not be a, a getaway free card from his accountability. What should have happened is that if you don't make the 180 days, is the supervisor gets disciplined instead of the idea that the officer gets to walk away and operate with impunity. So we should sit down and find out why some of these provisions exist. Some will have no good reasons, and it's based on just making sure people are not held accountable, but many of them have some basis or some managerial deficiencies to start, but there may be better ways to still address that deficiency without selling away managerial prerogative. One of the questions that's been asked is, can you speak to the ways that unions sanction or punish chiefs who go against the union line and how chiefs can withstand that. It seems that chiefs walk a fine line between endorsing reform and not alienating the union. Well, as a former chief, I think there's two things. One is the threat of a vote of no confidence is always looming, but it goes to what Christie said about community support. If you're going to reform the department, and that is the direction of the leadership, it is the, it is the demand of the community where communities are right now, then what I would tell the chief is that vote of no confidence is a badge of success. Wear it with pride. That means obviously you're doing something right. At the same time, in order to accomplish the mission that people are paying taxes for, the most valuable asset you have are your officers. And they must be treated with dignity and respect. They have to work in the conditions that are conducive to success. And so that doesn't mean you throw them out just out of political expediency. But, you know, this idea that if I want to change the use of force policy so that you don't shoot moving cars or shoot people in the back that are running away, if that gets me a vote of no confidence, then so be it. Then like you said, wear that with the pride, wear that with pride. But the key to that is not the, necessarily the courage of the chief, that you need to have courageous leadership, 
but you also have to have courageous political support that they know that the mayor and the city council is going to support that. And how you give them that kind of courage is by the community making it clear that these things are non-negotiable and they demand it. One of the, there's actually a suite of questions asking about practical steps that police departments can take to address white supremacists in the ranks, in the rank and file. Um, one person asks, given free speech rights of public employees, what are the possibilities for not hiring or for weeding out those with um, certain views? Um, and what changes you would like to see in either disciplinary processes in a collective bargaining agreement, civil service processes where those govern for police or possibly just departmental policies or law enforcement officers' bills of rights. All four of those could be sources of protection for officers. What concrete changes would you think would be necessary to enable police departments to discipline or weed out officers who are white supremacists without jeopardizing free speech or freedom of association rights for all officers? I will, Chris, you wanna go first? I can start. I, I would say, go ahead. No, go ahead, I'm happy to follow. I don't think there's a barrier to that accountability now. I think there's enough case law, whether it's visible tattoos, whether it's being part of organizations deemed to be terrorist organizations or certain designations. Most places have those policies and hiring that you can desperately deny employees and you can hold them accountable views. So the First Amendment is legit, but we've disciplined officers for comments on Facebook and social media. An officer uses the N-word and says something that is inappropriate. I think the courts have made it clear that it makes sense that how you, how can I, as a cop, how, as a chief, how can I trust an officer to then work in my community when they've made their views about the racist views so apparent. So I don't think there's structural, there should not be structural inhibitors to that anyway. I think the case law and the laws on the side, I just yet to have the political will to do that. And I think there's a balance, but I think it'd be pretty clear to, to say that anyone who's supporting white supremacy, the Proud Boys, the Boogaloo Boys, all, this, all these domestic terrorist groups have no place in law enforcement and we need to pay attention to it. And we need to make sure we're catching that and asking the right questions on the front end. But the biggest question we have to ask, and I, this is what I would say to my, my fellow officers, what's causing them to gravitate towards us anyway? I, 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 that's a question that we have to answer for ourselves is why they are coming this way. What is it that's attracting someone with those views to want to be a part of this family? Is that something saying about, is that, is that an indictment on us or is there something else going on? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just say I, I agree that the people often throw up the First Amendment as a reason why you can't contend with this issue. And I think that um, while there has been some really terrible guidance and training and people don't understand the law around this, um, and, and there are there are certainly, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, some hard questions, but for the most part, it, the fact is we have just tolerated racism for far too long as a nation and that has included our police departments. And we just need to get serious about not allowing people with white supremacist beliefs to be to hold a badge and a gun. And that's going to take most of all just our deciding to have no tolerance for that. And we're, you know, no, as 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 Ron said, you know, look, if you're a proud boy, you can't be here. If you're a boogaloo, you can't be here. That that's not about your First Amendment right. And that's in a lot of agencies, you know, people will say, wait, I have a First Amendment right. No, you don't. You do not have a First Amendment right to be a police officer and hold those views. That's not the law, and we are no longer going to tolerate it. One thing to sort of structurally help redo that, I think, is having more uh, sensitivity to that, more um, commitment to that at the recruitment stage, at the hiring stage. I think this is a place where diversity in recruitment and hiring really matters. I think if you have um, an officer apply for a job and he has, you know, a Confederate flag tattoo, 
it's more likely that some officer, you know, that a black officer um, is going to notice that than a white officer recruiting. It's more likely that's going to bother them. Um, I'm not saying that you know many it would bother many white officers as well. I'm not saying that, but it's really important to have diversity to sort of like recognize what it, the reaction that you the 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 what you're introducing into your department if you allow those individuals into it. And 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 Ron's right. We do have to understand why people are attracted to this, why police officers in particular are attracted to this. But while we're doing that, we need to keep police officers out. Now, the one area I think that gets tricky is where you have a president, as we have just had, who is pretty openly, pretty supportive of white supremacy. Because it's really like you don't want to tell police officers that you can't go to a political rally. You don't want to tell police officers that you can't support a president, of course. But what does that mean when you have a president who's supporting an insurrection, right? So I'm not, you know, that's just an example, but I, I, I'm, I'm worried that that's an example that we're, we will be faced with increasingly um, in the foreseeable future, and we're going to have to contend with that. But that is one swath of activity. And I would say, you know, for my entire career, I have had police departments tell me that, oh, the reason why we can't get rid of this unit with these tattoos or those t-shirts for that unit are you, is because of the First Amendment. And it, it's just not true. It's an excuse. In the just couple of minutes remaining, I wonder what each of you see as the best way to think about um, training police union leadership or perhaps supporting um, officers in the rank and file who want to organize other organizations. A number of people are asking what could be done at the federal level or at the state level to reform police unions as organizations. So I'm going to start and I'm going to go back to what I said is I think as a part of that reform, we need to reform policing so that the role of the police union is a part of that. And I would say this, if we embrace the idea that we have systemic deficiencies in policing and we still have structural racism and systemic racism, as for the first time the president has, this president has acknowledged, then we have to realize that the officers have to be more a part of the reform and not just a target of it. And that includes the union. And I think Professor Grodin said at the beginning, is bringing them on board to make sure that they have a viable role in protecting the rights of, the, of workers, but also contributing to where we need to go as a profession. And so I know there's a lot of education to be out there. I don't think that's the main issue because I think we, we for example, I think the big, biggest, Harvard used to host the Big 50. There's a lot of training, there's a lot of information out there. And so I think it's more than that. I think we, we the training never hurts, but I don't think that's the answer as much as really looking at the role of unions in 21st century policing is going to be different than it has in the past. Yeah, I'll just cite the example and it may not seem like the right example to a lot of people given Seattle's recent history, but although there were a number of officers in Seattle who opposed the consent decree there, and I think they had the largest contingency at the recent riot at the Capitol, the union there is actually fairly supportive. Of, quite supportive actually of the consent decree and the union president ended up being part of the uh, essentially an, an external oversight uh, board. Um, and so, and, and that I think reflected sort of a sense that among a, a significant portion of union leadership and, and the officers there that the, that police reform does not have to be a, a, a bad thing for police officers. It can absolutely make them safer. It can make the, give them make them uh, have better quality of life themselves and happier about their jobs. And it's just an understanding of that and in, 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 in getting through um, the fear that many officers hold and unions can absolutely be an important part of that. I so wish we could go on a lot longer just with the two of you, but we have a busy and long day of sessions ahead. So I'd like to thank Chief Davis, Professor Lopez for your very thoughtful remarks. I'd like to thank all those who posed really terrific questions that we didn't have a chance to get to. Um, we are going to take a 10 minute break. Uh, the Zoom room will remain open. At noon, we are going to hear from Judge Felton Henderson, his keynote address discussing police reform based on his experience. Um, and then 
Immediately after Judge Henderson, without a break, we will hear from Senator Nancy Skinner, California State Senator, about police reform initiatives in the California legislature this year. She has been a leader on this issue and had, is, has bills that she has carried in the last legislature and this one. And so I will see you again at noon for these two very interesting speeches. Again, thank you so much.